as you were yeah. saying now, yeah, thank you. As you were saying now, we have uh, Ido Gino, the founder and CEO of uh, a Rapid API uh, that will uh, be on stage for, for 25 minutes. Hello, uh, Ido, how are you? Good, good. How are you doing, Mehdi? I'm doing really well uh, from your nice office. Nice. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, I, I feel crazy every time I log in from here and like I'm in an actual office. Yeah, an actual, uh, in real life office, like IRL office, right? <laughs> Still yeah, exists. Yeah, it's not like a virtual background or anything. <laughs> yeah, it could be, but no, it's great. You're, you are one of the mo most promising companies in the, in the space uh, with Rapid API, and we really, we're really glad to have you there. And uh, you will talk with us about digital transformation in banking, how APIs are filling the next wave on financial services. We're really glad to to hear about that. And the stage is yours for 25 minutes. Enjoy. Cool. Thanks for that. And uh, yeah, maybe after this talk, I'll find a way to uh, to do get our competitors to pay us money to your uh, <laughs> quote earlier. Yeah, that that may happen. That's a good sign of uh, of uh, of success. Don't hesitate to share your screen uh, if you find the button. Like it's the third button below our two pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. And now I'll see, yeah, do you see the, like, the yeah. presentation? We see the presentation, we see it full screen, it's perfect. See you awesome. in 20 minutes. Thanks, Matty. So, uh, hi again, everybody. Uh, my name is, uh, or just maybe to reintroduce myself, my name is Ida. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Rapid API. Uh, some of you may know us as the uh, public uh, API marketplace. We also have an enterprise product on top of that, which I'm going to quickly touch on uh, at the end of this presentation. Uh, but more predominantly, what I want to focus on today is actually talking about APIs and financial services and kind of looking just given, I think, that this has been one of the most prominent industries in terms of adopting APIs and kind of being at the forefront of uh, creating APIs and publishing APIs, exploring how that have actually come to be and where we see that industry going in the future. So in terms of agenda today, I'm going to give a very brief overview of the sort of history of APIs and financial services. Uh, but more precisely, talking about where we've seen them coming from and how it's gotten to the point where the fintech in the, or the financial services, not even fintech industry, is actually at the forefront of this technological revolution. Uh, talk, a bit about, talk a bit about the drivers uh, that are causing uh, financial services companies uh, to create this API so quickly, and then touch on some of the best practices that we've seen, at least from the customers that we work and engage with, uh, that are important when it comes to actually doing APIs right. Now, just to maybe formalize some of the background around um, Rapid API and, and what we do as a company. So we started as an API marketplace. Uh, we help over a million developers around the world discover and connect to public APIs um, and are powering billions of API calls every day that are flowing through the Rapid API platform. Um, and then on top of that, uh, we also have our enterprise platform, uh, which is a custom private label uh, API marketplace that we deliver to customers. Uh, and in fact, we've been able to work with a lot of banks and financial services companies that have kind of been establishing their API platform, both for internal API consumption and collaboration between developers, but also to be able to expose APIs externally to their developers, to their partners, to their clients, uh, and help them establish those API platforms. Uh, so this is where we uh, start getting some experience working with uh, companies in that space. Now, before I dive specifically, um, into the history or the drivers around APIs in financial services. I just wanted to do, and I tend to start all my presentations with that recap, just looking at the API industry as a whole and kind of realizing how much APIs have proliferated over the past 10 years. Uh, we now actually see some predictions that this is going to become, end up becoming a $2.2 trillion industry. And one of the things that um, we found unique, especially as we started foraying into the space of APIs, but also API specifically in finance, is just how many of the big examples of companies that are being pretty successful around providing APIs are actually coming from the financial space. So even if you look at some of these examples of uh, some of the largest companies in that space, a huge amount of them actually creating a very large uh, amount of, of financial value comes from the financial space. So you see Vlad, which Jeremy talked about earlier, uh, which helps with interfacing with some uh, banking accounts. Uh, informa information and financial data. And then you have companies like ADN and Stripe around the credit card processing. And what I personally find shocking about these valuations is not just how big they are, but actually if you start comparing them to some of the legacy companies in the financial space. So, you know, for instance, we looked at Credit Suisse and, and Deutsche Bank, some of the largest banks in Europe. 
Turns out those API companies, all of which have been founded pretty recently, uh, are actually much larger in valuation than two of the largest banks in Europe. Um, and all of that, just to make that even more uh, permanent, all of that with far less employees in their ranks compared to some of these banks uh, on the right-hand side. So it just seems like APIs are um, you know, very big and very important in the financial industry. And if you actually look back and think about it, APIs are actually not that new as a concept in the financial space. And one of the drivers for that is the nature in which most of the software and infrastructure in the financial services space is built. So if you actually look inside to the banks, a lot of the banks were actually the first players to start looking at digital and then modernizing their infrastructure. And this kind of started in the 60s where a lot of banks started introducing mainframe computers. Then they started building the whole layer of ATMs and uh, automated banking on top of that. And, may, and then in the 80s, even introducing call centers on top of that. But then all of a sudden, looking at the last 20-ish years, they suddenly had an explosion of digital channels that they had to uh, start working within. So a lot of them started having uh, web-based portals and banking uh, interfaces, then also adding you know, iOS, Android, and, and mobile interfaces on top of that. And now even adding more things like voice assistants, chatbots, and a lot of different digital channels that help people access their banking. And one of the interesting side effects of that has been a lot of them ended up um, actually keeping some of this initial infrastructure and early systems that they built in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and they still have those legacy systems operating and actually maintaining customer accounts, maintaining uh, transaction data and some mission critical data like that. But then they also ended up building some of those more robust uh, digital channels that had to pop up very quickly. And one of the things that, uh, or one of the side effects that this had is that they had to create ways to interface between those legacy systems and the new application and channels that were being built. And that uh, glue or that interface ended up being APIs. So that was one of the initial early drivers in the adoption of APIs. And then another impact, and I'm not going to talk about this too much uh, for uh, lack of time, but we've also seen uh, this accelerated by the fact that a lot of the work being done in finance is actually about interfacing between different players. So moving money between banks, moving shares between different brokers. A lot of that requires interfacing and actually creating pretty significant networks that are all based around communication, which ended up turning into API. So the SWIFT network for global money transfer, uh, the credit card networks for um, performing credit card transactions and shops, all of those actually end up interfacing and involving some that sums and dance between um, different companies that end up relying on APIs to actually happen. So APIs aren't new, but we have seen their adoption accelerating pretty rapidly. Um, and the discussion about APIs in the financial services space accelerating pretty rapidly over the past few years. And there are three main drivers that we're seeing for that. So the first uh, driver that I'll talk about is fintech applications and more players that are not traditionally financial companies that, but are entering that space and relying on APIs to do that. The second driver that we're seeing is just global regulation, which is actually pushing companies towards creating APIs. And then API aggregators that are kind of, uh, and these are companies like Plaid, which are kind of creating their own APIs and forcing, uh, in a way, the banks to tag along with them. So looking at that first one, um, and the fintech application, we're seeing more and more, and, and this has been a trend uh, over the last couple of years of technology brands actually getting into finance. So one example is the Apple Card by Apple, so technology brand releasing a financial product. Uh, we have the Google Wallet or Google Pay uh, product that's being released uh, right now. And then you also have Facebook with the ability to actually send money via the Messenger app. And you'd think all these companies are actually turning into banks, but the reality is that that's not really happening. So if you actually look at the uh, Apple Card, that's just relying on Goldman Sachs, a traditional bank under the hood. Uh, same with Google Wallet partnering with Citi to actually power the uh, checking accounts and the transactions. Um, and Facebook, which actually partnered with PayPal for these online transactions. So these are the bigger players. We're seeing something similar with the smaller players. So even if you look at some of these startups in the space, like Venmo for money sending, TransferWise, uh, Robinhood, I'm, I'm, I'm sure everybody's familiar with these brands. Uh, but all these brands, while offering financial products, are not actually building those products themselves or rather partnering and relying on some legacy or traditional banking partners to provide some of the financial services. So for Venmo, that's Wells Fargo. TransferWise uses a uh, whole host of banks around the world to send money between accounts. Um, and Robinhood with Apex Clearing for actually moving and uh, transacting the shares. 
So the reality is that a lot of these uh, technology brands want to offer uh, banking products, but none of them actually want to be a bank uh, because that includes a lot of regulation uh, and restrictions that come with that. Um, sorry. So what we're seeing them doing is more predominantly partnering with existing uh, banks and uh, traditional banking partners and just relying on their technologies and offering a, an interface for customers around that. And the way that they were interfacing with those banks is by APIs that they exposed. So this has uh, been one big driver that we've seen pushing banks towards exposing more and more APIs. So this again, looking at that first point of FinTech applications. Um, the second area that we've seen uh, where banks are being pushed towards offering more and more APIs is actually global regulation. And a lot of that actually dates back to the financial crisis where a lot of global regulators realized that some of the banks were a little too concentrated and wanted to offer customers more mobility between banks. And if you actually look at some of the global examples, like this is from the UK, where we've seen that most, most adults actually end up opening a bank account when they're 18 and never really switching that. Uh, and you see very low numbers, even in that very advanced economy, of customers actually switching between banks. And the problem that the regulator has identified that's causing that is once you actually open a bank account, all of your data and your transaction data is being concentrated within that bank's systems. And if you're going to open a new bank account with a competing bank, you're going to start from scratch. And not a lot of people want to do that because that means they're going to get uh, worse access to lending, uh, mortgages, and things like that. So they started uh, pushing banks toward opening more open data to allow customers to move their data more freely between banks, thus opening the space to more competition. And we've seen a uh, pretty good global adoption of open banking standards, with now multiple countries uh, and multiple continents uh, pushing uh, banks in those spaces towards opening APIs. So this has been another big driver um, in another area where we've seen banks thinking more and more about APIs. And then the last one that I'm going to touch on very quickly is just the whole idea of API aggregators. So these are companies that realize that a lot of app developers actually want to get access to uh, financial information and want to allow people to embed financial information in their applications. But at the same time, a lot of these banks don't have APIs. And even if they do, it's a lot of different APIs that the, the developer has to interface with them. And what they started doing is leveraging, as an aggregator, both existing banks that have APIs as well as bots that are kind of um, using the bank's interfaces to get data out to offer a unified API to uh, application developers. And this was a big... Um, um, a big calling for a lot of banks to realize that, A, they need to open up APIs, but they also need to open up good APIs that developers will want to work with directly. So these are some of the, you know, both pushers um, from both like a carrot and a stick perspective, uh, giving banks and financial players incentives uh, to go into uh, opening APIs and embark on that journey, but also pushing them to do that through regulation and other means. Um, and I think that this is now where a lot of banks are thinking about APIs, and also seeing the big opportunity uh, by, uh, that opening APIs and creating that ecosystem allows them. So these are some of the pushes uh, or the drivers that we're seeing for the creation of APIs. And as a result of that, we've been working with a lot of different banks recently, helping them go and embark on that journey and organize their API strategy. And from that experience, uh, there are actually five um, key pieces of advice, I would say, um, or recommendations that we've seen uh, that help companies uh, get APIs right. So for the next couple of minutes, I'm just going to cover these and walk through some of those best practices that we've been seeing. The first pattern that we've seen to work pretty well, um, and I'll touch on that first, is the concept of starting inside out. And what we've seen there is a lot of players actually think of APIs as an external product that they're exposing to their customers and want to start by working on that. We've actually found it to work better when you look at the internal APIs that many of these banks already have and microservices, microservices and other systems that are already talking via APIs. Working first on organizing those and then taking a subset of them and starting exposing them first to partners and, lately, and lastly to, um, to developers in the broader community. So if you think about it, a lot of these banks already have those internal APIs and we've seen getting those APIs done right and organizing them is critical and it's really the first step that needs to be taken, just cataloging those, organizing those, and putting a good API strategy in place. Then you can actually go and expose a subset of these APIs to partners. And these are normally people that you already work with. Uh, they're either existing customers or partners that where there's already a relationship. 
So you can give them APIs that are maybe not as ready, uh, but starting to get to get their experience and see how they're interacting and using those APIs. And then lastly, being able to take an even smaller subset of those and make them completely public so developers all around the world can go and innovate on top of these APIs. And one of the main reasons uh, to embark on that journey uh, is actually the fact that most companies already have a lot of existing APIs. So this is a survey. Uh, this data is actually from a survey that we've done uh, earlier this year where we've seen that the average company at large scale actually has 300 or more um, APIs throughout their architecture. So that's a lot of APIs. And oftentimes just organizing those and using those to get the API muscle and API skill going um, is pretty important. Now, as part of that transition, uh, the second thing that we've seen as critical to get APIs right is actually investing in a good API platform. And think of that API platform as a place to organize all the APIs and serve both the API creators and publishers as well as the API consumers and be able to use that same platform both as an internal tool around those 300 or more internal APIs that are already out there, but also as an external tool facing the partners and customers who are going to be using and integrating with those APIs. So we see that as a critical platform serving, on the one hand, the API creators who are going to be designing those APIs, uh, developing them over time, um, and publishing them and choosing who can see them throughout the organization. Uh, so that's on one hand, the creators of the APIs, uh, but then also allowing them to expose the APIs and serve them to both internal developers who want to discover and connect to those APIs um, and the external developers um, who are going to be consuming those APIs from other companies. And we've actually ended up doing a mapping um, of some of the features or capabilities that are important to each one of those stakeholders. Uh, so I'm going to cover that very uh, briefly, but I think that's important as, to understand those requirements as you go about setting that platform. So from an API creator perspective, the main way in which we've seen them interact with that platform is thinking about publishing the API documentation and exposing it to other developers, integrating with the CICD gateway to get better integration um, with the rest of their systems and be able to update those APIs over time, uh, control access and visibility of the APIs, support multiple API types. And this has actually been a big trend that we've seen recently, looking at things like WebSocket and Kafka-based APIs as well. Um, and then last, looking at monetization and actually charging those for those APIs. And that becomes especially important when talking about uh, exposing those APIs to external partners as well. From the other hand, we've, you know, from, from some of these internal developers and external developers consuming the APIs, the important capabilities that we've seen are, you know, having one place to search for all of these APIs uh, and be able to get to the right API more quickly by using concepts like tagging, filtering, API collections, and things like that. Uh, looking at very easy and straightforward interactive API testing to help developers ramp up and start using those APIs more quickly. Um, and then looking at you know, code snippets for making the integration easier, as well as monet uh, monitoring and analytics to understand over time how, that, uh, how those APIs are performing. Uh, so this is overall um, some of the key components that we've seen when thinking about the API platform. And another suggestion that we have around that API platform, and this goes to the next stage of API deployment flexibility, is thinking about making it as easy and as seamless as possible for developers to actually go about pushing and publishing APIs to that platform. So thinking about from the first stage in the API lifecycle, just envisioning and thinking about that API initially, making it easy for developers to actually place that API in the catalog, even as a mock API or as a placeholder, and start getting feedback so that that whole API design flow um, and development lifecycle is well integrated with that API platform. So to sum up where we are right now, uh, think about starting with internal APIs before going with, um, and working on public APIs, establishing a centralized API platform, and then getting APIs into that platform as early in the process as possible. Uh, the two other components are pretty critical as well. Uh, the first one is just thinking more about developer experience. And I think um, this was actually touched on in the previous uh, conversation as well, uh, but I'm just going to mention that quickly. Developers today, both internally and externally, expect APIs to work in a certain way and to be easy to use and easy to get started with. Um, and this is where we see a lot of new players, even if they're not offering an API product that is net new and did not exist before, but winning the market in a pretty meaningful way, just by virtue of offering a better experience that developers actually want to use. And this is where you see the likes of Plaid and Stripe actually shine. And I think that uh, Patrick Collison, the CEO of Stripe, actually had a really nice quote about this. 
uh, when he asked, uh, when he was asked to describe what they do in a TechCrunch interview, he actually described it as, we're making a payment platform that doesn't suck. And I think that that sums up really well how to get APIs right. Just make sure that they don't suck. Um, so yeah, developer experience really matters in building those APIs. And again, think of starting inside out. You want the developer experience to be right, both in aiding the internal adoption of APIs, as well as later on to make it easier for partners and, um, um, and other players to adopt and use those APIs as well. And then the last point that we see is pretty critical is just thinking of making room for new products um, and new types of APIs. And this is where we've actually seen a lot of banking partners that we work with making really interesting headways. And that's when they start thinking not just of the basic uh, banking APIs, so you normally think about financial transactions, credit card processing, accessing users' account information, but actually expanding beyond that to leveraging some of the data and infrastructure that they has, have as banks and offering new products. And we've seen really interesting products being offered by banks in this area. So things like um, being able to do age and, and identity verification, just by virtue of, you know, if somebody has a bank account, they can log into this bank account. The bank had to have um, performed KYC and validated that user at some point, so you can actually get real information. Uh, things like being able to deliver documents in real life via banking branches. Um, and actually, a host of other really interesting new ideas where banks are leveraging all the data and the infrastructure they already have and using that to offer new services to developers. So I think that that's a really interesting um, area and that the banks can actually make really interesting things by thinking in those areas and opening up the spigot to allow their developers to offer uh, and, and build those new products more seamlessly. So I know there was a lot to, uh, to get through, um, but maybe just to, uh, um, to summarize what I've talked to throughout this conversation. Um, so we're seeing a big proliferation of APIs and banking for three main reasons. FinTech applications, which are actually relying on the traditional banks and requiring them to open APIs. Regulation like PSC2 and open banking, which is open, which is pushing banks towards opening more and more of these APIs. And then API aggregator players. There is a set of popular APIs uh, that we're seeing most banks start with, uh, both internally within their infrastructure, but also externally, uh, but also an opportunity for a lot, uh, for many new types of APIs to be exposed. And then there are five general recommendations uh, that we've been making to banking partners that we work with. So starting inside out, working with internal APIs before going external, thinking about creating a good API platform that's gonna be robust and allows, good, and allows good discovery and publishing of APIs to internal and external developers. Uh, think about a flexible deployment cycle and getting APIs out there um, and visible to the rest of the uh, API customers, both internal and external, as early as possible. Getting and investing a lot in developer experience. And then again, think about new products and all the new possibilities that those um, API strategies unlock. Um, so this was a... a my very quick um, conversation here. I do hope that this has been um, um, that this has been interesting and uh, and relevant for everybody who's out here. Um, and uh, hope, yeah, hoping to see more uh, interesting APIs uh, coming out of this. Yeah, thank you, Ido. Thank you very much. One question uh, we've seen is. Uh, like it seems many startups and fintechs actually build an API just to disintermediate people because they have the best developer experience and then they will build product later. Just an example, Stripe, who take, who has taken over the developer ecosystem and now they sell directly. Uh, they do like some kind of loans or debit cards, right? Uh, loans for small businesses. So they try to be a bank at some point. I don't know if they, as you say, they, they will be a bank, but at least they take they do banking products at least at some point and on the other side you have some banks that partner with you to be able to deliver apis right to be the, the sexy for developers and, and own the developer experience so how do you see the both kind of matching who will win this like uh, this struggle yeah i i think that the banks that will end up winning are those that realize um that Offering APIs and more than that, offering good APIs is no longer an option in many ways, but it's a must have at this point. Uh, so if you think about a consumer, you know, let's say I'm a consumer, I'm using some, um, I have an account with some bank, but then I know every time I want to apply for a loan or every time I need to pay somewhere, 
I can't log in with my bank account, but I actually need to go and copy all the account details manually and I can't see a real-time transaction update with that client application. That might be because they don't have a good API. And as a consumer, I don't know that it's because they don't have a good API, but I'm gonna get frustrated with my bank account anyway and consider switching in the future. And we've even seen that in the corporate world. Uh, so more to the Stripe example, we've worked with a couple of big banks, uh, both in North America and Asia that have actually come to us and said, look, our corporate clients, when they make batch transactions, they don't wanna send us file anymore. They expect us to have an API. And at this point, if we can't offer them an API to make things like transaction or uh, balance inquiries or things like that, we're gonna lose them to another bank because that's what they're expecting these days. Um, so yeah, I, I think that there are gonna be companies that will monetize on banks, maybe being a little bit behind in their API journey, but we're also seeing uh, banking uh, catching up pretty quickly and realizing that having a good API is a must have at this stage. Hey, Mehdi, I'm actually not hearing you. Yeah, yeah. No, sorry. I was saying that, uh, yeah, it seems there is a gap. There is a gap that actually, uh, that's an opportunity for fintechs to fill before all the banks are actually doing it properly. And it seems a little bit what Rapid API is doing, like before in 20 years or 30 years, everybody does API is great. Like there is a huge gap that actually your, your platform can, can can answer. It's One last question uh, from the community is that, uh, which, which are the top three countries with the largest API developer community? Maybe with Rapid API numbers, you can you can tell us from your, your opinion. Yeah, I think for us, um, the community that we've seen in Rapid has been truly global. And I think that especially now with uh, COVID and uh, everybody working remotely, it's kind of, it, 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 in a weird way, it feels like it's breaking down some of those barriers. I think for, for our community, it's probably biggest in the United States. Um, and that might just be a work product of that being where our team is based, um, or at least the majority of our team. Um, and then behind that, uh, for us, Europe as a whole, and the UK has been pretty big. Uh, we've seen a lot of developer activity there. Um, and then India actually has been uh, where we have a large community of developers too. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ido. Uh, have a great day. Uh, enjoy uh, your nice office. <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, as long as we still have offices. <laughs> Thank you, Ido. Yeah.